All right, welcome to the lecture today. We'll talk about uh, another concept called quantum dots. And then we'll look at MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. Uh, before we get going, so we all are working on graduate research, group research proposal, right? So just wanted to share team makeup. You guys know that already. And I had extended the deadline, right? So some teams, they have uh, had taken time with me in office hours. They have discussed their ideas. Some teams have sent me email with their overall team. So but sometimes some teams have not done anything. So that's fine. But it's always a good idea to talk about what is your plan, right? All right. So one thing that it's very important when we talk about nanomaterials or things at small scale is concept called quantum confinement. You must have uh, heard the word uh, quantum somewhere uh, here and there. If you have taken solid state devices, then you have definitely come across quantum numbers, right? So quantum numbers are those four numbers which define the state of an electron. So electrons are rotating around nucleus, right, in different shells. So that set of four quantum numbers tells us exactly where does that electron belong to, in which orbital, which suborbital, and tells us the energy also, right? Now, what does it mean, quantum confinement? Now, the thing is, if you keep on making things small, smaller and smaller, and you uh, make them so small that we start interfering with the electron spin around nucleus. We basically start interfering with the uh, band gap, with the energy levels of a material. So they start behaving differently. So quantum confinement is especially more prominent in semiconductors. The simple reason is in metals, electrons would be freely flowing. So there's no problem. You can make them small, then keep on flowing. Or in insulators, there's no free electrons for conductivity. So not a big deal. But in semiconductors, we can change the energy of an electron and it can jump from wireless band to conduction band. I don't want to go in that detail in this course, but we'll just touch upon. Now, if we start changing their energy gap, then their band, uh, their uh, behavior will start changing. Now, this change in behavior, how do we see? We'll see how we could use it to our advantage, the concept of quantum confinement. But it happens at uh, dimensions below two nanometer, which means, whatever entity we are dealing with, it has to be two nanometer or smaller than that. The way we can uh, see an increase a role of quantum confinement. Now, if, if that entity that we are dealing with is zero dimensional, one dimensional or three dimensional, and you have seen the examples of that in a uh, soft chalk lesson that I had, we would give them different names. So in, in we would call it either quantum well, quantum wire, or quantum dot. So now, how does that help us, or where does that help us? Just give me a second, let me deal with. So we would look at the size or the properties of the material that we are dealing with. If it's a nanoparticle, but it's not a, just a nanoparticle, it's a special nanoparticle because it is supposed to be semiconductor. And if it is what we are calling quantum dot, then it has to be an optical semiconductor. So what is an optical semiconductor? A semiconductor where we can get light out of the material a different way. Sorry about that. Now, zero dimensional, 
one dimension a one dimensional can be a wire a long very long entity carbon nanotubes for example they are one dimensional they have only lengths they don't have width they have width but it's almost negligible compared to the whole lens just give me a second everything is connected to everything else so i don't know how to shut the iphone down from putting the call through now let me go back to that slide 1d is a wire a long thing like carbon nanotube 2d would be a kind of a sheet and 3d would be a bulk right something that has volume but in all these three uh, all these four kind of dimensions we can make them so small that we start interfering with the with the behavior of electrons now i said zero dimensional quantum dots there are two conditions it's not just every semiconductor these are few semiconductors and they have to be optically receptive which means that if an electron jumps from conduction band to valence band it gives out energy so that energy if it comes out as a photon that's a, what you call as optical material now if a material is confined in one direction its energy uh, would result into very specific states we call it density of states i don't want you to go too deep into that but we we need to understand why does the wavelength change that was a question that was asked in one of the bdes point also that for one material there's supposed to have one band gap there's supposed to have only one wavelength that comes out of it hi krista so but now how do we change the wavelength how do we get another light so that's a property that we can tweak at nano scale and that's what we are what we call as quantum confinement so when we make them confined in very specific direction then we would have to deal with their behavior and in our in this case what we call as quantum dots the behavior behavior is that they would give out light right so this is just the recap of band gap solid state devices and if an electron jumps from conduction band to wireless band the extra energy is given out as uh, what we call as wavelength as a photon of specific wavelength and that wavelength depends on the the band gap that it's jumping so now when it, when you can find it in in zero dimensions which means a particle and if that particle is uh, made of an optical semiconductor material we get quantum dots this is just a picture showing a few atoms coming together in a crystalline structure and in a round shape so what's happening is they have a, a, a three dimensional quantum confinement they they have no way to go and now when you would change their size the wavelengths that comes out of that quantum dot would dip, would be different so th that's now the wavelength or the color of light may becomes dependent on the the size of the the quantum dot so again what is a quantum dot it is a nanoparticle right why what are two requirements for it to become quantum dot or what is the basic definition of a quantum dot it has to be semiconducting material number 2 an optical material which means when the electron jumps from conduction band to wavelength band the extra energy is given out as wavelength so these are these are the materials which are used in all the optical devices in your camera in your cell phone in photo detectors or your uh, garage door you know garage door if you if you have to if you cross it it starts going back so there is a there is a, a what do you call photo detector and a photo emitter on that side and they have to be aligned all right so now this is a simulation of showing a gallium arsenide quantum dot with only 465 atoms so we are talking about just few hundred or even less than that so <clears throat> they are semiconductors they their behavior 
is that they would be composed of two, six, or three, five material. And we can adjust their band gap by adjusting their size, right? That's what it is about. Now, <clears throat> when you say that their size can lead to different wavelengths, so essentially what happens is we are playing with the quantization of energy, what energy levels are available, and, and that would result into different levels. So we're just showing wavelengths, and this figure is much more uh, depictive of what happens. So you make it too small, you are making a jump to a kind of a smaller uh, band gap, which gives you a bigger wavelength, right? And if the size becomes larger, you get smaller wavelengths, right? So, and there's something not new. So quantum dots have been there for a long time ago, but we didn't know how to make them cheaply. We didn't have equipment to understand how they are uh, how they can be used. But now there's lots of work going on, especially in, the, in bio applications and in energy applications, because they are optical materials. So we can use them to either uh, put into a living system and look for specific places where they may go. For example, you can coat them with uh, some molecules that can bind to cancer cells. So we, now if we inject them in a living system, those Quantum birds will reach the area where the cancer is and they will get stuck. And now from the outside, you can shine the light and you can measure the light, which is coming from that living. So there are lots of papers on that, which shows that we can use them for biological tagging, right? Now think about it. We are talking about just 500 to 1000 or maybe this range of atoms in that quantum dot. So these are very small. They can penetrate through lots of barriers and give, a, give us lots of uh, precise information about the localization of, of bad things or even good things in living things. There is uh, now, if you think about it, they are light or the difference in the light for the same material. We can use them to differentiate between two types of uh, cells maybe. So that's an example shown in this, this paper where they had uh, different sizes of same material. It's cadmium, selenide, zinc, sulfide, quantum dots, but they can image cancer cells in a, in a live uh, mouse. Now, depending on their coating, they are going and adhering to different parts in that living system. It, this is a very important figure because it sums up uh, a lot of things there. So we are seeing that uh, this is also from this paper in science. What we are seeing here is that just by changing the size C from two to 10 nanometers, right? Which is a very small change, right? If you go from, for example, from three here, this is two, if you go from two to say five, you're not, you're changing, maybe just doubling the size, but what you're seeing is you're going through almost 475 nanometer to 600 nanometer. So there's a big change in the wavelength of the light that's coming out. And, and we know the wavelength will depict what kind of light we get out of it. So, this is an interesting picture figure which tells us a lot of information that just by changing size very slightly, you can dramatically get the different wavelengths coming from uh, that quantum dots. So they have used it for uh, increasing the efficiency of solar cells also. This is about storage. So. Let me, uh, this slide has gone out. Just give me a second, let me correct the slide and then put it back in.
All right, so they, now think about it, optical storage. We have, uh, we already use optical storage. CDs, compact discs, DVDs, Blu-ray discs, they're all optical storage. So we are using them to create blue laser. So if we can create blue laser, we can read very small dot. Hence, the same CD, which had, I don't know, 650 megabytes. Now, because the reader has become very sharp, we can now put, how much data is there on a Blu-ray disc? Beto, you know, how much data we store on a Blu-ray disc? Around 50 kilobytes. Kilobytes? 50, five Gigab zero, yeah. Gigabytes, yes, around five. Yeah, DVD, we had 4.7 gigabytes. So Blu-ray is yeah, probably 10 times that. Yeah. Only because we can make very fine laser. So that's a direct result of using quantum brats in there. And, and the science is that uh, we can make many more excitons from a semiconductor material. So exciton is electron hole pair. So we used to have a very particular size, but now we have a, a way of making different size of uh, particles which can give us different band gaps and different wavelengths. So there are lots of YouTube videos on how to they make quantum dots. I will not run the video, I can share the link. But the thing is this, you can make quantum dots on a simple desktop. Right. All you need is a few chemicals, some heating, and this thing on the left is showing a glowing flask. So they have created quantum brats which are very visible. In there. So this is, uh, this is showing about what I was saying that now with quantum brats you can make very, very fine laser and that can give you uh, going from uh, CD to DVD and on to Blu-ray disc where now the wavelength of uh, laser is going smaller and smaller, which means we can put much, much more data on that. So it's 44.9 gigabytes that you can write. Now, the lower one is showing you the wavelengths, so we can go into blue. Is a region. double layer, sir? Is this double layer or dual layer? So double, your flip yeah, so they write on both sides. You have the oh, coating, okay. you might as well write on both sides. Now, which means 25. 25 each side. Yeah, so you can write on both sides. So the next time somebody says Blu-ray, you would know that it, we call it Blu-ray because using we are using blue laser region. We are using the wavelength of blue light. With that, we can make very, very, very small pointers. And hence, we can make, if you can compare CD to DVD, we can put many more zeros and ones on this one. And Blu-ray, even many more. So that's a direct result of nanotechnology, quantum dots, right? You know, they got, uh, for the blue rail, uh, for the blue LED, they got Nobel Prize two years ago, probably five or five, six years ago on blue LED, because blue LED was missing, a cheap way of making blue LED was missing from white LED. They could make red LEDs, green LEDs, whatever, white LEDs were not very common because white color is combination of all those fundamental colors and blue LED was hard to make. It was expensive. So they make it cheap. Now we see white LED everywhere. All right, so now we use them to create white LEDs, right? And then you say quantum LEDs because what they do is they're superior. They're superior in their efficiency because they would give more photons for every electron that jumps through. Normally one electron jump would give you one photon, but they would give multiple photons. And that's another reason why we want to use them in quantum computing for qubits to store information in with light, right? So, and, and for solar cell, why you want to, they're, they're three properties that give us uh, a unique capability to increase efficiency of solar cells. 
we can make hot carriers. There is, there is definition of that. But the, the thing is that there are multiple uh, phenomena that's occurring when you have quantum dots in the solar cell. There is hot carriers, there are multiple exciton generation, multiple electron hole pairs are generating for one electron jump. And quantum darts give us intermediate energy bands, which means we can absorb many, much more light than just regular solar cells. So that's another thing that if you use this, that can possibly boost our efficiency to as much as uh, they say 65 percent. Hold on, what's going on? It's trying to annotate on this slide. So this can boost solar power efficiency from just 20 to 32 as much as 65 percent. Right? So the reason those three reasons, which we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide. So they can create hot carriers, which is that we can, uh, photo generated carrier can get to deep inside the material and then they can uh, turn and move from higher energy level to lower energy level, both in electron, uh, in conduction band and valence band. So, which gives us different tuning. We can capture many more of those uh, high energy and low energy electrons, right? Because different, if it's a very, uh, what do you call it? a hard carrier which jumps to further in conduction band, we can use a quantum rod which has a bigger band gap. So we will not lose that energy. So that also will be converted into a photon. That's what's called hard carrier. On the multiple exciton, now when they jump from their high level, uh, what's shown here, from high level to low level, they can emit one photon and then from conduction band, they can emit another photon. While electron is jumping from valence band to conduction band, it can knock off other electron on, on its way as well. So again, jump of one electron gives us more photons than regular material, where one electron jump would result only in one photon, but here it would give you more photons, right? So that's, uh, we are just comparing photon energy with quantum efficiency. So think about it. We are getting more than 100% efficiency if we use quantum dots in uh, solar cells, right? So the third reason was intermediate bands, which means that in a regular material, we cannot have energy bands in the forbidden zone. But if you use quantum dots, they can introduce intermediate bands and that can give you more energy levels and hence more photons from jump of one electron, right? So a little bit more technical, but if uh, you have some basic concept of band gap from solid state devices, this becomes easy. But even if you don't have a big picture of this is that quantum dots can, uh, are already making big changes in, in biological tagging in solar cells in data storage, right? So these are very big high level contributions of uh, quantum dots. Now, we have seen they are made from two, three uh, different semiconductor materials, right? So this is just showing the crystalline structure here of cadmium selenide nanostructure. So they have to be, again, semiconductor, crystal and semiconductor material, and they have to be optically active, right? Any questions on uh, quantum dots? All right, so let's uh, maybe we can stop here and uh, 
I would like to focus on uh, GRP. Any questions on GRP? All right, very good. Good luck with that. And uh, we have less than a week left. And um, I'll be here the whole weekend if you get any questions, right? We need, I would love to wrap up everything. Yeah, Beto, go ahead. Uh, are we going to have a final test? We'll have a final test. And I'm looking forward to have a little bit similar like a quiz kind of thing. OK, right. thank you, thank you. All right. All right, guys, I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you.